salt and light. So I want to do a, a review from last week because it's very important because we're building a foundation. One of the things that I've shared with you guys, one of, uh, one of the pastors that is one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Winston, I shared this before and we just saw what happened in baseball. I was sharing with someone who was a baseball enthusiast this week. One of the young men that plays for one of the major league teams uh, has been suspended for 80 games because of performance enha enhancing drugs, because of steroids. 80 games without pay. And this, this, this dude makes a lot of money. Somebody say a lot of money. So now I want you to understand why I'm laying this foundation and why it's important for you to understand that God has called you to be here. And it says, no other foundation can any man lay except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why is that important? Because you can't build a spiritual house without the master of the house being the foundation. Everybody got it? So Pastor Bill Winston, I asked him years ago in a meeting, I say, Dr. Winston, what do I need to know as a pastor? And some have heard me say this before. He says, Pastor Nias, make sure you build this ministry on and by faith. Pastor Nias, make sure you build this ministry. How? On, on and what? By faith. by faith. So first thing I want to know, I don't like being in places because I, a lot of what shapes you, even in your, in your ministry, particularly as a pastor, is sometimes the things that you didn't get when you were growing up. When I went to Prayer Tower Church of God in Christ, I could say it because it's real experience. And by the way, in the Bible, if you want to know when Jesus, the distinguish between when Jesus is teaching and, and giving a parable, and a parable is simply a natural illustration to help you understand something spiritual. A parable, all it is, is a natural illustration to help you understand something spiritual. So for example, if I would want to use a natural illustration in this day and time of prayer, I would say this, if you'll talk to God, he'll give you downloads. Everybody got it? But during his agrarian society, when Jesus was on the scene, he wouldn't have talked about something in reference to a computer download. Everybody got it? So the methods may change. Everybody got it? The methods change, but the word doesn't. Everybody got it? So Pastor Bill Winston said, make sure you build your ministry by faith. What do you mean, Dr. Winston? He said, you make sure you build it based on what the Lord told you to do. Don't you go around studying all these different ministries and just copying what they do. Don't you go around and stand up here quoting other ministers. You get a revelation. You spend time with God for yourself. And then you teach God's people what he wants your people. Because if he's teaching a shepherd in Oklahoma... He don't necessarily want them teaching your people in St. Louis. Everybody got it? So I, he said, build it by faith. Hey, so God gave me this unusual scripture when we're, Pastor T and I, 15 years, by the way, 15 years, we're celebrating 15 year, our 15 year anniversary. And I don't keep in contact. And I don't think about stuff like that. You notice we haven't had any 15-year anniversary. But God placed people in here, and Brother D actually put it together on the text. And I saw it. I said, oh, yeah, this is 15 years, right? So can we praise God for 15 years? And you haven't seen nothing yet. I said, you haven't seen nothing yet. So God gave me this unusual scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. You put it up there. Put up uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Everybody say foundation. foundation. So I want you to understand what, and this was unusual. Like, like, I want a God, give me something. Give me something else. Give me something on fire. Give me some smoke or something. And that's what people want, something tantalizing, as if this the world. The world do things to get your attention. God do things intentionally. Everybody got it? Look what it says. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding. Go up to verse 5, please. It says, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Next verse. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom 
and your understanding in the sight of the nations. In the sight of who? The nations. There's an S on that. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this is a great nation. Surely this great nation is a what? Wise and a what? Understanding people. This church, people are going to hear about. And I, when I say the church, I'm talking about you. And they're going to call you wise and what? Understanding people. Next verse. For what nation, what church is so great? We were singing a song this morning. Thank you, worship team. How great is our God, right? So look what it says. What nation, what church is so great who has God so close to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him? So in other words, back to prayer again. When you pray, he's going to answer. And then you're going to get close to him. That's why we put those big old words right out there on the back of this wall, and you'll see it on the wall. What person, I want you to know God, I want your prayers answered. I want you to be able to say something, and it happens. I want you to understand that I don't care what you've been through, I don't care what curses come from your family, that if God introduces his son to you, he wants you to stop it. He wants you to say, not another day, not another hour. Sickness and disease will no longer be in my family. He wants you to know you have the power. Come on, married couples. Come on, married couples. We're called to welcome people home who's struggling in their marriage, who's sitting here with a smile on their face, but can't wait and thinking about getting a divorce. He's going to send them here. Because he has allowed people that stand here to go through stuff. That's what I love about it. See, don't ever make harsh, major decisions during dormant seasons. Come on, put that in the chat. Come on. What do I mean? You know dormant seasons. The leaves are already starting to fall, right? And then it gets cold during the winter and it's snowing outside and that tree has no leaves. And the tendency is to think it's dead. But it's not. It's in a dormant season. And do you know God would allow you to go through dormant seasons, not just for yourself, but because some other people are going to come that's going to need to know, hey, you're just in a dormant season. Can you imagine a tree quitting, asking somebody to chop it down because it doesn't have any leaves? Am I, am I giving you a good illustration? Right? And do you know there are seasons in life? And the natural is reflections of the spiritual. So every natural phenomenon has a spiritual connection. That's why Jesus would use parables to help people understand naturally so you can understand what's happening to you spiritually. Pastor T and I have been and have walked through seasons of dormant. And in seasons of dormant, if you don't understand covenant, you'll chop the tree down. Amen. Woo! I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen out here, boy. Has anybody, can any couple stand up to tell me that and show these people, these single people who want the man of their life, the woman of their life, who going to save them like Cinderella? <laughs> Can anybody stand up, if you're a couple, stand up and you know you've been through a dormant season, you're in a dormant season, or you soon will be in one, and God is just as real when you dormant as he is when you got leaves on your tree. Can you stand to your feet? Come on. Now, everybody else, can we praise God that they are fighting they are staying with it. This is not a knock on anybody who's gotten a divorce. Don't get that, hey, he's talking against me. No, if at all possible, if the house is burning, we want to save it. If at all possible. But sometimes you just can't. We understand. But there's some people that really want to know that God is real. The three Hebrew boys didn't know about the fourth person until they got in the fire. Yes. Moses didn't know that God was part fire, but he won't consume until he saw that tree was on fire, but it didn't burn. And a lot of times what you're going through, how many of all have been through the fire with your children? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
testify with your children. But they're the seed of the righteous. So we got to speak that even during their dumb days. And always remember your dumb days. Because sometimes I forget about my own dumb days. But if you will remember during that time, I got my, the prophetess tears are saying, yes, you, you sure do. I, I don't need you helping. You may be seated. I don't need you helping with this message. <laughs> Everybody says it's time for a change. So I wanted to do a, a, a review. I want you to understand we're called a raise up a what? And I want you to see who, a wise and, uh, a wise and understanding people who, and here, here are the four things. A wise and understanding people who know their God. Yes. Everybody got it? Yes. Did you know that? And that word is Gnesco. That don't mean from scripture. That means relationally. Yes. Amen. It's the same word where the husband has intercourse with his wife. You know you know him. Say so the children of Israel knew the acts of God. Right. Moses knew his ways. Right. When you know somebody's ways, you don't have to pray as much. Yeah. Mm. All right. <laughs> Amen. I can tell you right now, you made for a purpose. Yes. And the sooner you find it, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. And the reason why purpose is so important is because you can waste your life. Waste your life. Young people, a lot of times we just got to get them through the season of craziness. The, the frontal uh, cortex of the brain does not even form. That's the judgment part until you're age 25. So your children think they know it all. I think it was Mark Twain that said when I was 17, I didn't think my parents knew anything. And then he said at the age of 22, he said, I was shocked how much my parents had learned in five years. <laughs> So you got to understand, your children's brain not even fully developed, even though they think they're all that in a bag of chips. Somebody say amen to this, all right? So what is God doing? He's giving you a natural understanding of the foolish behavior of our children. And how many of y'all know that you, our parents dealt with that too? And I am assured, and I don't have them yet, but I think grandchildren is God's gift for not killing your kids. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Somebody say, I show you right, because some of y'all got them grandkids. You could spoil them and send them home. <laughs> Why we exist? We exist to raise up a wise and understanding people who, number one, come on, say it. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number four. Now, what I'm finding now all throughout Scripture the redemption plan, and this is it, is in so many different ways and mentioned so many different times. It was never about sophistication and learning all this stuff. It says knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So it's really not about all this this knowledge. At times you hear me refer to the congregation as, and you'll hear me make a statement, this is not school. One of the reasons I share and I make that, that declaration, because I want, how many would raise your hand and say you sat in classrooms in school and didn't hardly learn jack? Yeah. Okay, some of y'all lying. We Put your hands down, let's pray right now for the people who won't tell the truth. I ask you, how many sat in some of these classes and didn't know what it was about, how it related to everyday life, and all you wanted to do, because you were taught your parents would give you a few dollars if you just got a good grade. So all you do is, you, you what do they call that when you stay up all night? Cram. Cram. There it is. You cram, you cheat, whatever you need to do. But it wasn't about reality and the existence of life. That education was never supposed to be like that. The word educate actually comes from the Greek and it means leisure. You were supposed to acquire knowledge through your time of leisure when you're thinking. Wow. I spent a lot of time thinking. And you're supposed to think and meditate on what's been uh, taught to you. This was never supposed to be school. Church is, he's calling you out of the world. It's called an assembly. To do what? 
Educate means to draw out. That's what it means. It means to do what? That's why you don't go and decide what you're going to do based on the dollar amount they're going to pay you. That's why so many are making tons of cheddar and cheese and money, but still miserable. Why? Because it was never supposed to be driven by a financial gain. It was supposed to be that I know was for me. And I could tell you, this, 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 this acknowledgement that God is still all these great HBCU players, far better than me. But God will put somebody, my name on somebody's heart, that they would do whatever they could to get this done. It's the same with the Pro Football Hall of Fame, that some reporter would argue your case in a room of reporters because God put your name on their heart. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. Do you know that's the same way with you? Yeah. But you got to get to your purpose. You got to get to what you're supposed to be yeah. doing. Yeah. You got to know that God has created you for a purpose. Yeah. Somebody say purpose. purpose. Know God, find freedom. Now, what does that mean? It goes all the way back to the children of Israel. Salvation, you and I have nothing to do with. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I don't have nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is God's work and his alone. I'm so glad because if I got something to do with it, I can have something to do with him taking it from me. If I had something to do with it, then that means something I do can take it from it. Here's the question for all of those that want to keep doing to get saved. Mm. How did you become a sinner? Was it by doing? Last time I checked, you be born a sinner. So if you had nothing to do with your sinship, why do you think you could have something to do with your saintship? <laughs> Come on. If you don't understand, your father, when he introduced Jesus, was telling you without telling you, I've already chosen you. I already see you in your state that I've created you to be in. I call it, and then I work through your sanctification to get it done. Because I know what the world has put on you, superficial. I know the world has put that other people are stars and not you. I know that society has told you, if you grew up in this neighborhood, you are not one of the smart ones. I know, God knows what you've been through. I'm going to show you in a few examples that your heavenly father, he meets you where you are. He meets you where you are. And the thing I love about God, you're going to see in a second. Y'all want to know, know what I, I love about God, Brother D? That I've been recently just thinking about? He's a God of privacy. He won't put your business on the street. I can hear, I can hear some, I can, I, I can hear some right now who probably living their life and they feel like they, they don't, not doing anything wrong. I hear them right, right. I can hear them right now. I can hear them. I can hear voices when I teach. Here's what I hear. Well, if you ain't got nothing to be hiding, he ain't got, he don't need no privacy. Uh huh. Because they don't know that God is holding privacy in an area that they're not aware of. It could be self-righteousness. could be pride. Because they measure life based on big sins. Wow. Instead of God told them to pay for somebody's meal and they said no. They don't realize God kept that private. That's why he says none righteous. Can I just, if I can just get in your face and tell you, none righteous. <laughs> None righteous. Let's I go. said none righteous. You hear me, my man? None are righteous. You know what that means? Nobody in right standing with God apart from Christ. All of us are a hot mess apart from Christ. Am I in the right place? So I wanted to go over last week. Because this was the Passover Seder. Because all of it's throughout the Bible. You hear this stuff. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, we're praying. Man, I had a chance to meet one of my Jewish brothers, see one of my Jewish brothers. And, and he shared with me, because many of y'all may not know, I was invited to go speak at a synagogue, a temple on Yom Kippur. To get that. Can you imagine that? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. At one of the, probably one of the most influential synagogues in the country. 
And when you go speak somewhere, Pastor T and I went and spent some time with someone. And we were invited uh, by him and his family. And then we did dinner with his family at the table. And it was an amazing time. But when you teach, sometimes you want to know, did I make a difference? And I just saw the person at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Because God has set up things and he'll get you information. And I was on the stage and then I saw him. And the Spirit of God said, go give him a hug. And he, when, we, when I gave him the hug, he says, man, they're still talking about when you taught at our temple. They're still talking about, I got to get you back involved in the work that we're doing. What I'm saying to you is just find your purpose. Just do what you're called to do. And God will open doors no man can close. Yes, yes, yes. So in this process, I want you to understand the process of God. He always wanted you and I to know him. Somebody say know him. Know him. That means experience him. I don't care how young or old you are. I experienced God at a young age. Then find freedom. The children of Israel got out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't get out of them. Exactly. So how many times have you, are we going to get rededicated? Yes. Wow. Most churches stop at these two, salvation and then keep getting delivered. But what if you find freedom? And one of the ways there, there's going to be a freedom life group this fall. And one of the things we want you to do is get in that group. Because freedom, freedom, get this, comes in the context of relationships. He said confess your faults to one another. Confess your sins to God, confess your faults to one another. So you can get healed. A lot of times we're doing life in an ISO. In other words, we're isolated. Versus having people in our lives. And where that can uh, help us walk in freedom. So it said, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. This is a review. I, I didn't want to go any further without repeating this back in your ears. We exist. Why we exist? To do what? Raise up a wise and an understanding people who know God. Come on. Number three, discover their purpose. Number four, make a difference. Now, the Passover Seder. Seder is the Jewish, when they do Passover, and Passover, the first two days of the Passover meal, or the Passover celebration, the first two days, they do the Passover Seder. And it's to remind them there's some things they quote, there's some things they chant during this time. The Passover Seder, Seder means order or procedure. Passover Seder, order or procedure. Here are the four cups. They drank four cups of wine. I said it last week. Four cups of wine. Y'all ready? Here's the four cups of wine. The first one is the cup of sanctification. That's salvation. God brought them out of Egypt and they didn't die because they were in the house behind the blood on the doorpost. So the first cup they drink is for salvation. Somebody say, I'll drink to that. I'll drink to that. <laughs> <laughs> this was wine, by the way. The second cup, the second cup of deliverance. The second cup was supposed to be deliverance. Okay, you're out of Egypt, but now you're getting ready to walk in deliverance. You're getting ready to get your issues. And I said last week, if you don't think you have issues... That's your issue. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? Everybody working through something. Would somebody raise your hand if you're working through something? So you're saved, but do you know when those, the, those Hebrew people faced some adversity, they were ready to go back to Egypt? Right? Because they were not delivered. They were out, but not delivered. Somebody say, I'm getting delivered. I'm getting delivered during this prayer, 21 days of prayer. I'm getting delivered. This is the year of ascension. I am getting delivered, walking in freedom. Somebody say freedom. Freedom. The third cup is the cup of redemption. Redemption is when something is brought back to be put in its original state. Salvation was supposed to get you back to the real you. Where you stop pretending and stop trying to be somebody else. Your name is your name is Aeneas. Stop wanting to be Kelly. Stop wanting to be Ralph. I didn't want my name to be Aeneas. I want a name like Chris or Ralph. Because I got tired of in uh, Carter G. Woodson, these jokers calling my name Anus. 
Now y'all laughing, y'all know I used to hit people for a living, right? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want, you won't change your name, but once I realized my name means praise. It means praiseworthy. And then on my rookie card, on the back, they phonetically sounded it out. It's a, me, us. That taught me how to teach people to say my name. I thought it was amazing. And I learned that from my rookie card. So redemption, <laughs> so redemption means you've been brought back to be put in your original state. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Nobody can beat an original you. And one of, the, one of the toughest things younger pastors deal with, or younger people deal with, is trying to emulate other people. And you can learn things from other people, but you can't be them. Everybody got it? So here's the Ford cup. The Ford cup doing cedar is the, the cup of what? Now that's not praise and worship like we do. I said this last week. Praise is when I finally got to, I got freedom, I'm saved, and now I'm in my original state. I know my purpose. Now you can praise God with your life. Now there's fulfillment in your life. Now you're not chasing after other things, which is synonymous to being thirsty. Right? Everybody say, no more thirsty. Hit somebody right next to you because they may try to go to sleep on this one. Look, hit them right now and ask them, are you thirsty? No, hit them again. Hit the person in front of you and tell them, are you thirsty? <laughs> John chapter 4, verse 1. The subtitle of the day, title is Salt and Light. I want to close out with this. Everybody say three wells. In the Bible, there's a lot about wells. Now, we grew up in cities, so we don't know about wells. We got water, we turn on the faucet, we good. Any country folk here grew up on a, remember the well? Anybody remember the well? There's a lot of talk about the well. So I want to talk about three wells, and I want to do it real quick. There are three things I learned from these three wells. I learned, number one, that God is private from a well experience that Jesus had. I also learned that God is a God that answers prayer at a well that Jacob's, I'm sorry, Abraham's servant experience he had at a well. Then I, I learned from a well experience Jacob seeing Rachel at a well. And I learned about purpose. So I learned at the well, this one, I learned private. Put private back up. I learned private. John chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1. Let's go. Everybody say private. Private. It's important for you to understand that God is a private God. I like to say it like this. Grace is God giving you and I an opportunity to deal with it, with his help, before he has to take it public. Yeah. How y'all like that? Yeah. Here we go. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized, but his disciples did the baptizing. He left Judea and departed into Galilee. Jesus is strategically being led by his father to go in these specific environments. He left Judea and departed. And, verse 4, and he must needs go through where? Samaria. Everybody see that? That English word, or we can use it, it says must is an imperative necessity. You got to do it. Why does he have to do it? Because his father told him to go here. Come on. Next verse, please. Then come he to a city of Samaria. He's where he's supposed to be, which is called Sychar, specific details, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob, everybody say Jacob, Jacob. gave to his son Joseph. It's important, Jacob, we know later his name, Israel, but in this example, it's Jacob's well, because Jacob's well will, will actually is referencing the well that still caused you to be a trickster. The water that you drink, it still caused you to be tripping in the world. Still cause you and I to be doing things, to be phonies, doing things because we're thirsty. Mm. This well you'll keep going to 
but it never, ever quenches your thirst. So God is going to use a natural well to tell y'all why we thirsty spiritually. Y'all ready? Then come he to the city. So he's there. Jacob gave this to Joseph. Next verse. Now Jacob's well was there. Whose well? Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver, trickster. He was a trickster. He, he stole his brother's birthright. He was a thief, trickster, phony guy. Now Jacob well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey. I like this. <laughs> Woo! Get this. Jesus was tired. Everybody see that? Wearied? Because yeah. of the journey, right? But I want you to make sure you understand. Jesus was tired, but he wasn't thirsty. He tired. See, a lot of us get tired, but we, and we mess around getting in trouble because we're thirsty and tired. You're going to find out Jesus is not thirsty, but he is tired. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There come a woman of Samaria to draw water. How many of you all know he knew who she was already? This is God on the scene. He knows this woman, knows everything about her, but I submit to you that he's arranged, our Heavenly Father, our Lord, have arranged a meeting with a thirsty lady with nobody in the audience. Watch this. There come a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. Remember, he not thirsty. He's only activating the prophetic reward that comes from you doing something for a prophet. Somebody say amen to this. Amen. Next verse. For his disciples, uh-oh, everybody say privacy. privacy. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. They gone. Because there are a whole lot of things happening here. Number one, Jews not supposed to be talking to Samaritans. Let alone a man talking to a woman. So he didn't want them asking a bunch of questions and shoo shooing with each other. You go y'all behind and go buy me. Because I'm getting ready to have a private conversation with a woman who's thirsty can only be quenched by her meeting the right man. Woo! Yes! So now everybody say private. So there's a private moment. This God and this woman. And she got issues. She thirsty. Yeah. She shacking and lacking. <laughs> Tweet that, baby. Next verse. Then said the woman of Samaria unto Jesus. She doesn't know who he is. That's the awesome thing about privacy with God. She doesn't know who he is, but he knows who she is. I can tell you the end. She's really an evangelist. And we're going to see in a second. Some of your researchers say she is also an apostle. Very interesting. An apostle, just think of one sent, sent by the Lord. The 12 all seen him. And the, th the, the 12th one, once Jews killed himself, Saul saw him supernaturally. The other 11 hung with him. So I'm physically. And then there are others that are sent that are also apostles. Because I hear people say there are no more apostles because the only apostles are the ones that really saw Jesus. Everybody got it? Yeah. I'm just, I give these out just little tidbits. Thus said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me, which am a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. She's right. But not God. God deals with all. Right? So she's thinking his race. Not realizing God is controlling this man. Next verse. Come on, roll with me. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that said unto you, Give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you what? Can't hear you. Living water. Living water. Keep flowing. The woman said unto him, Sir, you don't have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. 
So this is what I learned in reference to this well. It's deep. What you inherited from your family? It's deep. Yeah. You got to have somebody that will put a lid on it. Because all of us, even once you're born again, I've seen, I've been on fire at times, and then I've seen things crept back in my life that was in my family. Yeah. Because sometimes you go through life and you get injured, your soul wounds. And what people don't understand that if, you, if your soul gets wounded, you can't see that. But really, when a soul is wounded, it says it becomes diseased. And it says that disease begins to cause all the inordinate things to be desired again. So a lot of times people are dealing with stuff. They were once on fire, walking with the Lord, and then something happened. And all of a sudden there's a wound. And a wound, a soul wound, you can't see. That's why it says he was wounded for our transgression. Right? Wounded. See, the soul gets wounded. And a wound is below the skin. So this lady has some issues. She says, sir, you don't have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Because he wasn't coming there for water. He was coming there for an experience. That this lady would experience God. And the well is deep. From where do you have this living water are you greater than our father Jacob which gave us this well she doesn't know who he is and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle yes that's why all of them doing the same thing because they all drank it from the same well the grandkids and the kids all from Jacob's well but you got a well sitting on top of a well and you got to lead to Jacob's well. Yes. Yes. That's Jesus. Yes. That's why it's so important for people to get saved. Yes. Not come to church. You don't, you don't get saved. You don't get right and then get saved. You get saved. And it'll help you do right. Yes. Come on, is this good, family? Next verse, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drink of this water shall thirst again. Big Sean, some of the young people know, he's an artist. When he was first younger, before anyone knew him, he was out in Hawaii doing a recording session with Kanye and Jay-Z. Now for all of those that don't understand why I teach the way I do, I want you to understand, I don't just prescribe to any music. I'm telling you the stories because these are natural things that your young people and people are experiencing. And you can learn from anybody. Yes, yes, yes. Big Sean is young. Nobody hardly knows him. But he's been invited to do a recording with Jay-Z and Kanye. Yay and Jay. Or as they say, Hove. While there, he has a homeboy with him. And that homeboy was so excited, he snapped the picture of Kanye, Jay, and Big Sean without them knowing, and then posted it. And then Kanye and Jay found out about it and say, man, they brought him in. And they said, hey, man, what you doing? And by the way, Big Sean said, nobody even hardly knew me during that time. He said, I didn't do it. He said, I didn't even know that my boy did it. And I certainly didn't know he posted it. And Kanye and Jay was getting ready to kick him out. And he said, hold up. He began to explain to him, I didn't do this. And that's when he said, conversations save nations. He had to explain to them his boy did it. And then Kanye said, oh, you got to fire him. He said, because you didn't do this, but it looked like you thirsty. Looks like you want fame. Looks like you trying to set it off. So my question is, what's your thirst? What's your thirst? Is it fame? Is it, man, I want people to listen to me? 
What are you thirsty about? And it's personal. It's personal. But he's at the well, and it's private, and he will deliver us, cause us to walk in freedom. That's why as I train the, the thousands of young pastors that the Lord has sent, a lot of times when you're young, you start thinking more about people patting you on the back. How do I look? You go through all those phases. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again. Some say this, is, this lady represents the church, by the way. But whosoever drink of the water that I shall give you shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to, into everlasting life. Somebody say, give me that water. Give me that water. Next verse. The woman said unto her, sir, give me this water yeah. that I thirst not and need to come hither again. Jesus said unto her, go call your husband. She's so cold. <laughs> Isn't that cold? Like, he didn't say that dude you living with he said, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, you've well said. You don't have a husband. You're telling the true girl. Next verse. For you've had five husbands. Everybody say privacy. No one's here. Take these private moments with the Lord. He can handle it. Can I tell you a secret? He already knows. Right? He already knows. You know, you're dealing with something. Maybe you're dealing with weight. You're dealing with, I want to get in, I want to be healthy. Take that to the Lord. Stop taking it to the people that can't answer prayers. And he whom thou hast is not your husband either. You telling the truth, lady. God can handle your truth. But he has grace. Next verse. The woman said to her, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I guess so. I guess you do. Our father's worship, now she's getting ready to get religious. Our fathers worship here. Now she's ready to get into some religion now. Our father worship here on this mountain. And you say, Jerusalem, we got to go take this trip. Next verse. She said, honey, check this out. Woman, believe me. The hour coming. And matter of fact, the hour is now. You won't have to go to Jerusalem or any other place. You don't have to go to Mecca. You don't have to go to Israel to meet with your father. Next verse. You worship what you know not. We worship. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Next verse. But the hour coming and now is. Somebody say now is. Now is. One true worshipers. And by the way, worship means at least two things. Bow down, but also surrender. A lot of us are very good at bowing down. I know I have been. But the surrender part. Yes. It's to surrender now your will to his. And now when the true worshiper, somebody say true worshiper, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Everybody say privacy. privacy. Next verse, please. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. In other words, submit your spirit to him, and in truth, the things he lay out to be true. Come on, we get ready to go home with this. The woman said unto him, I know the Messiah coming. She don't even know who she's talking to. Which is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Come on. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am he, woman. Yes. And upon this came his disciples. The privacy. Once he said who he is. Now the boys show back up. And upon this came his disciples and marveled. 
They, they now, now that they see in this, they did just what he probably thought they were going to do. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. Yet no man said, what is she seeking or why is he talking to her? Next verse. The woman then left her water pot and went her way in the city and said to the men, uh-oh, everybody say evangelist. She hasn't gone through discipleship classes yet. She hasn't gone through a wise step class. She hasn't read a Bible. Which has nothing to do with your witness. All her job is she getting ready to talk about the seventh man. You think those numbers are by accident? The seventh man. Five husbands shacking with the six. I'm getting ready to take you to the completer. That's the number seven. The woman didn't left her water pot. I guess you did. And went into the city. Now you got to realize it wasn't big cities like ours. How many of y'all know that at least five dudes know they've been with her? Didn't matter. Because she met the Messiah. When you meet him, you stop all this insecurities. Because when you've met grace in person, you can feel non-judgment. You can feel validation even though nothing has changed yet. And the woman then left her water pot and went her way to the city and said to the men. Sound like this is a lady of influence. And you know the other thing I know that God knows? If she's had five husbands, all those guys saw something great in that woman. So God getting ready to now redeem her. Put her back in her original state and put her in the office of an evangelist. Next verse. Come see a man. Come see a man. Which told me all the things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? She said, come see me. Come see a man. I finally met a man. I finally met a man. Next verse. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And I'm finishing this up for a reason because we're getting ready to experience a harvest. We're in the month of August. We got four months left. Watch this language the Spirit of God showed me. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Next verse. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, saying, Master, eat! Master, eat! But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And that's what it's like when you're doing your purpose. Next verse. Therefore said his disciples to one another, Did he get something to eat? Did somebody drop him a, 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 a doggy bag? Next verse. Jesus said unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to do what? Finish his what? Finish his what? Next verse. Say not there are yet four months. And then come the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. I sit down and I say to you, family, it's harvest time. It's what? Harvest time. It's what? It's what? You ain't got to go through all the wise stuff class. We want you to go through them. You ain't got to go through all the discipleship. We certainly want you to. But nothing can stop you from telling, I met a man. I met a man. I met a man. I met a man.